Hello and welcome to the Beyond Shakespeare podcast. I am your guest host, Liza Graham. I don't know what you did to deserve that in a past life, but it must have been pretty egregious. And tonight we have The Play of Love by John Haywood as a first look exploring session. Um, so uh, to John Haywood, a wonderful guy, he uh, uh, not not of noble birth. Uh, he was of, uh, he was gentry, uh, and he moved to become a royal a royal servant to I believe four monarchs, uh, simply by virtue of being talented and being a nice guy. Um, so uh, uh, he wrote these plays, uh, the play of love. Um, we we will see. There are four characters here, and we have assembled a crack team of readers to read these four characters. Uh, character number one uh, is The Lover Loved, read by... Helen Good, a uh, historian in Hull. Character number two, The Lover Not Loved. Hi, I'm Greg uh, from stratford Avon. Character number three, Neither Lover Nor Loved. I do hope this isn't true. Angela from London. <laughs> and for the woman beloved, not loving. Rachel, actor from the coastest with the mostest. Excellent, excellent. So uh, there is a full cast audio adaptation uh, of of this play on the uh, Beyond Shakespeare audio boom channel. There's also uh, a wonderful interview with historian Greg Walker. Uh, uh, on the um, uh, uh, at that same channel, and uh, you can see a lot more of Hayward's works on our YouTube channel, featuring some of the beautiful faces you see here before you. And without further ado, uh, let us um, let us jump in. Uh, and the first character we meet is the lover not loved. Take it away. Hello, sir. Whoso that looketh here for courtesy, and seeth me seem as one pretending none, but as unthought upon the suddenly approach the midst among you every one, and of you all saith naught to any one, may think me rude perceiving of what sort ye seem to be, and of what stately port, but I beseech you in most humble wise to omit displeasure and pardon me, my man is to muse and to devise, so that sometime myself may carry me. Myself, knowing not where, and I assure ye, so have myself done now, for our Lord what, where I am, or what ye be, I know not. Or whence I came, or whither I shall, or this in manner as unknown to me. But even as fortune guideth my foot to fall, so wander I, yet wheresoever I be. And whom, or how many soever I see, is one person to me is every one. So every place to me but has one, and for that one person every place seek I. Which one, once found, I find of all the rest, not one missing, and in the contrary, the one that one absent, though that there here, sorry, the, that one absent, though that there were here pressed, all the creatures living, most and least. Yet lacking her I should and ever shall be as alone since she to me is all. And alone is she without comparison concerning the gifts given by nature. In favour, fairness, and porters of person, no life beareth the like of that creature. Nor no tongue can attain to put in her, her to describe, for how can words express, the thing the full whereof no thought can guess. And as it is a thing inestimable to make report of her beauty fully, so is my love toward her unable to be reported. As who saith rightly, for my sole service and love to that lady is given under such abundant fashion that no tongue thereof can make right relation wherein I suppose this well supposed unto you all. And since she is perceiving as much of my love as can be disclosed, even a very right in recompensing, she ought for my love again to be loving. For what more right to grant where love, love requireth than love for love when love naught else desireth? 
but even as far as worse as, as otherwise, then so stand I in case manner desperate. No time can time my suit to ease my woe, before noon too early and all times else too late. There's time, out of time, mistimeth my rate. For time to bring time to hope of any grace, but time timeth no time in any time or place, whereby till time have time so far extinct that death may determine my love, sorry, my life thus deadly. No time can I rest. Alas, I am so linked to griefs, both so great and also many, that by the same I say and will verify, of all the pains, the most incomparable pain is to be a lover, not loved again. <laughs> the woman beloved not loving entereth. Sir, as touching those words of compassion, which ye have said and would seem to verify, if it may please you to stand thereupon, Hearing and answering me patiently, I doubt not by the same incontinently yourself to see by words that shall ensue the contrary of your words verified for true. Fair lady, pleaseth it you to repair near, and in this cause to show cause reasonable, whereby cause of reformation may appear, of reason I must and will be reformable. Well, since ye pretend to be conformable, to reason in avoiding circumstance, briefly by reason I shall the truth avance. Ye be a lover no whit loved again, and I am loved of whom I love nothing. Then standeth our question between these twain of loving not loved or loved not loving, which is the case most painful in suffering. Whereto I say that the most pain doth move to those beloved of whom they cannot love. Those words approved too might make a change of mine opinion, but verily the cases ye put it, I think more strange than true. For though the beloved party cannot love again, yet possibly can I not think, nor I think never shall, that to be loved can be any pain at all. That reason... Perceive it and receive it for truth. From proper comparison should clear confound me between pain and no pain. No such comparison groweth then, or I can on comparison ground me. To prove my case painful, ye have first bound me to which, since ye drive me by your denial, mark what ensueth before farther trial. I say I am loved of a certain man whom for no suit I can favor again. And that have I told him since his suit began a thousand times, but every time in vain. For never ceaseth his tongue to complain. And every one tale which I never can flee forever in manner where I am is he. Now... If you to hear one thing everywhere, contrary to your appetite, should be led, were it but a mouse, lo, should peep in your ear, or all way to harp on a crust of bread, how could you like such harping at your head? Muted. Somewhat right. dips pleasant it were, I not deny. Then somewhat painful as well said, say I, this pleasure and pain be things jointly annexed, for as it is displeasant in pain to be, so it is painful in displeasure to be vexed. Thus, by displeasure and pain, ye confess me, whereby, since ye part of my pain do see, in my further pain I shall now declare that pain by which with your pain I compare. Small were the quantity of my painful smart, if his jangling pierced no further than mine ears, but through, through mine ears directly to mine heart, pierceth his words, even like as many spears, by which I have spent so many in such tears, that were they all red as they be all white, the blood of my heart had been gone or this quite. And also in case, and 
almost in case as though it were gone am I, except his suit take end shortly, for it doth like me even like as one should offer me service most humbly with an ax in his hand, continually beseeching me gently that this might be sped to grant him my good will to strike off my head. I allege for general this one similitude, avoiding rehearsal of pains particular, abbreviate the time, and to exclude surplusage of words in this our matter, by which ensample, if ye consider rightly my case, at least twice ye may see my pain as painful as your pain can be. And yet, for a shorter end, put case that your pain were oft times more sharp and sore in degree than mine is at any time, yet will I prove plain my pain at length, sufficient to match ye, which proved to be true, yourself shall agree. If your affection in that I shall recite, may suffer your reason to understand right, you stand in pleasure having your love in sight, and in her absence, hope of sight again, keepeth most times possession of some delight. Thus have you oft times some way ease of pain. And I never know way, for when I do remain in his presence in deadly pain, I sojourn and absent half dead in fear of his return. Since presence nor absence absenteth my pain, but all the way the same to me is present, and that by presence and hope of presence again, there doth appear much of your time spent, out of pain me thinketh this consequent, that my pain may well, by mean of the length, compare with your shorter pain of more strength. And uh, we'll break for discussion. Oh my gosh, okay, well, uh, the woman uh, loved but not loving has set forth her case why it is a great discomfort uh, to be uh, to be loved but uh, by, by someone you don't love. Um, and and I, I imagine that uh, the lover not loved is, is going to have something to say about that. Uh, who, who is in more pain? And where do you think the audience's sympathies are meant to lie? Rachel, Rachel, thou art muted. Oh, I was gonna say not with number four. Um, also just the, the how I feel like this is rhyming words with themselves uh, in the middle of it, just playing with the language in that way. Um, yeah, yeah, lots of lots of rhymes rhyming with pain. Um, uh, and I don't know, perhaps this is uh, a, an example of maybe a, a limited vocabulary on the subject of love or a very focused vocabulary that hasn't that that doesn't change much with time. But uh, I'm spitballing here. Who, who else wants to, to jump in? Helen. The word surplusage. <laughs> did appear at some point. Uh, I felt it was a very apt word. Right. <laughs> there, are I thought awful, they there are an awful lot of words here. Uh, and I think you they would have to be spoken very fast. There, there, there also seems to be a complete lack of punctuation occasionally that first speech i felt like i was just hurtling and you're right head and i think speed is arrescent but there were times when i thought am i actually going to hit a point where i can breathe in inverted commas here because and i love the fact that i that's probably the, I, I i feel like i've read a speech like that before but the very much the sense of how many times can you get the word time in a speech <laughs> Yeah, time recurs in your speech, pain in Rachel's. Uh, Angela, and then Rachel. Uh, yeah, so I, I think that that's right, that if you can, so if this was, I don't know where this was intended to be performed, but um, you were saying that this guy, 
you know, uh, would sometimes play for the court and other kinds of people. And it and it has that feel to it. This just like playing one thing after the other. It's kind of rhetorical uh, style, isn't it? It's a it's a it's a rhetorical vehicle to have surplusage of words to keep on playing over the one word as often as possible um i think it's something that we're not really into these days we quite like you to get on with it <laughs> it is that and rachel what were you no i was going to bring up the kind of what angela was just saying that this it, it is like a philosophical way of speaking but when two people are talking about it on this sort of subject matter and they're arguing a case for themselves as to who's in more pain, that it, it, it is that fast comedic element that could just make it the, uh, who, who was it in um, the glass of government that was so woe is me that the two dads I think are just so woe is me that and over the top, uh, you know, that we get the, these long speeches kind of in the neoclassical stuff that makes it, uh, seem like these two people are being very over dramatic. They're, I don't think there's a, I, I think all the houses, they're all dry eyes. They're not crying for these people. Well, they not, pity themselves enough. Well, not yet anyway. We'll, we'll see it as we go on, but yeah, you're right. I mean, Haywood is, as you can see, there's, there's a lot of wordplay. Um, I was thinking, again, I have no authority for this and I'm just spitballing, but I wonder if it was because he wasn't nobly born, but he was writing to be viewed by nobility, and perhaps he feels a need to prove how intelligent he is. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've seen this in other plays. I, I don't know, uh, Greg, I think you were here for Witty and Witless, which is, uh, if you think this one is wordy and self-referential, going to that one. Um, and yeah, I think, speed it in in performance um speed would be in performance speed would be great it would also take some preparation but you know find your own pace with this trust the line uh trust the thought it is almost like music the way that certain words recur haywood started out as a chorister then got hired as as a a singing man which means an adult uh, singer then uh, he was hired, then he pops up being paid to play the virginals, which are the keyboards. Um, and uh, so some of some of it is music. It's and some of it makes a little bit more sense rhythmically than it does verbally. However, um, I think Rachel was right to reference neoclassicism because there's a lot of there's a lot of very conscious rhetoric here. Haywood characters argue uh, in a, in a very intellectual way. And sometimes the question is not who deserves the most sympathy, but who has the best argument. Uh, and I, I guess, I, I guess we will see that, uh, as, as we go on. Um, so, uh, the, uh, the, the lover not loved has, has conceded that, uh, that that the situation of of the lady might be a little bit uh, he said something like somewhat displeasant it were uh but i think he's probably about to tell us how displeasant his situation is um and uh yes in your own time take it away lover not loved mistress if your long pain be no stronger than is your long reason against my short pain Ye lack no likelihood to live much longer than he that would strike your head off so fain. Yet lest he should, lest he would note me your words to disdain, I am content to agree for a season to a grant and enlarge your latter reason. Admit by her presence half my time pleasant, and all your time as painful as in that case can be, yet your pain to be most reason will not grant. And for an ensemble, I put case that ye stood in cold water all a day to the knee, and I half the same day to mid-leg in the fire. Would ye change places with me for the dryer? Nay, that would I not be assured. Uh, forsooth, my pain above yours is as ill as fire above water does to be endured. Come, came my pain but at times, and yours continues still, yet I should, yet should my many ways to whom can skill show yours 
In comparison between the twain, scantly able for a shadow to my pain, felt he but one pang, such as I feel many, one pang of despair or one pang of desire, one pang of one displeasant look of her eye, one pang of one word of her mouth as in ire, or in restraint of her love which I do require. One pang of all these felt once all in your life should quail your opinion and quench all our strife. Which pangs, as I say, admitted short as ye list, and all my time beside pleasant as ye please, yet could not the shortness, the sharpness so resist. The piercing of my heart in the least of all these, but much it overmatcheth all your disease, for no wit in effect is your case displeasant, but to deny a thing which ye list is not, which ye list not to grant. Or to hear a suitor by daily petition in manner humble as wit can devise, require of things as standing in condition as no portion of all this is enterprise, without your consent can speed in any wise. This suit does attempt it never so long, doubt ye not death till your pain be more strong. Now, since in this matter before us disputed, mine admittance of your words notwithstanding, I have thus fully your part confuted. What can ye say now I come to denying your principle? granted in me my full saying which was this by the presence of my lady i granted you half my time spent pleasantly or the fine affection leadeth me to consent that her seld presence is my relief only yet as in reason appeareth all my torment bred by her presence and to mark this cause why before i saw her i felt no malady and since i saw her i never was free from twain the greatest pain that in love be Desire is the first upon my first sight, and despair the next upon my first suit. For upon her first answer hope was to put, put to flight, and never came since in place to dispute how bring if then her presence to me any fruit. <sighs> For hopeless and helpless in flames of desire and drops of despair I smolder in fire. <laughs> These twain being endless as they had began, both by the presence of her holy began and continued. I wonder if ye can speak any word more, but yield immediately, for I had no more pains but these. Yet clearly a thousand times more is my grief in these twain than yours in all the case with which ye complain. That is as ye say, but not as I suppose, nor as the truth is which you which yourself might see by reasons that I could and would disclose, saving that I see such partiality on your part, that we shall never agree, unless he will admit some man indifferent, indifferently to hear us, and so give judgment. Agreed, for though the knowledge of all my pain is my pain, no wit, yet shall it declare great cause of abashment in you to complain and counterfeit pain for my pain to compare, but here is no judge meet, we must seek elsewhere. I hold me content the same to condescend. Please it you to set forth and I shall attend. And okay, so um, pause for discussion. They've, they've both agreed that they can't, uh, they, they can't be uh, a fair evaluator of their own situation because they're both in so much pain. So they have to find someone impartial. Uh, and, and two has done a pretty good job, I think, of laying out uh, why it's terrible to be a lover not loved. Uh, what do what do what do we think? Thoughts from the room, Helen? Yes, I, I mean the first time I I really connected with this was when they had an absolutely solid metaphor. It's like the difference between you standing in water and me standing in fire. And that 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 was solid. And I was very pleased to see it. Otherwise, there was just a sea of words. <laughs> uh, Angela. Um, <clears throat> when you mentioned earlier about disputations, um, it, it, it reminded me that, of course, that's actually a, a manner that happens in church. It happens at universities. It happens other places. So I, was, I guess that's the other thing that this would be, you know, on one hand, it's funny. I mean, it is it's getting to be funny. <laughs> and also that sense of how you dispute and that that's very much of the time. I, I, I think I'm starting to get the hang of this now. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Uh a testimony surely to greg i really ad admired your flow there uh th 
and 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 the lover the the lover not love gets some very uh gets some quite amazing verse that whole felt ye but one pang such as i feel many one pang of despair and he goes on and goes on for an entire stanza and so it is maybe a little bit more lyrical whereas whereas beloved but not loving is is maybe a little more appealing to the cerebral or or appealing to to the sensible uh, what what do you guys think i needed a stiff drink after that <laughs> i mean it was fabulous and i and i and i said in the chat i almost turned it into rap because of that sen the sense of the the verse um it's wordy, but if you actually take it at that sort of speed, it works a lot better. Because though I trip up, I tripped up it a couple of times, but it really felt more with it, and actually easier to understand. Almost, I was really struggling at first. Going back to something I meant to say, it was interesting. I found whichever one I am, two's first speech, almost to be a prologue mixed with a bit of backstory. I found it quite an interesting. He's very good at... I, I find it really interesting play, and I'm quite glad I'm now off for the rest of the night. Because... <laughs> yes, <laughs> My yes. poor voice can't take much more of that You have to look for, for that impartial judge. But Rachel, Rachel, what was, what was yours? No, I want... Uh, how Helen said that it's kind of that wall of text that you get, I wonder if it's meant to be spoken so fast and there is this lack of imagery that it's just supposed to be these two people and maybe that's the reason for these repetition of words that she says pain 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 so much and they are repeating themselves um you know because they're supposed to be rattling it off and there's not uh as much imagery uh or as much simile uh that you might get in other texts uh, because it's not, you know, um, to not give as to not give an actor as much to not not to not give them as much to work with, but not to ask them to be coming from that emotional place, but to be coming from a different place. They're not declaring their love. They're arguing who has it worse, just who has it worse. These are two people in their like little pity party. That want to pull people in and it's very much in the abstract isn't it because neither of them have told us anything about the person or anything like that we've got no context whatsoever this is a purely abstract discussion yes i when you have a lover not loved and someone who is beloved but not loving on stage your first thought is well it must be each other they have feelings for but uh you know they they seem to refer to the their their uh opposite numbers in the third person so um who knows i my guess is i don't i don't know where the audience's sympathies originally were meant to lie nowadays they would probably lie with the person uh who is beloved but not loving just saying oh my god you're being stalked it's terrible uh but uh we we live in we live in an age of get over it we live in an age where um you know even from something like a death you're supposed to be cheerful and by by a month or so later um we we live in an age where i think anyway where the expression of emotion uh opens opens you to ridicule and mockery and all and all kinds of um ter terrible things on the other hand, if you do love someone and they don't love you, not making a nuisance of yourself is the very least you can do. Um, did I just speak a rhyming couplet? Oh. I'm afraid you may have done. Uh, that must be the ghost of Haywood, um, uh, who, who, might, who might be perturbed that we're not carrying on with the play yet, so why don't we do that? Um, both of our previous characters have exited to find an impartial judge of their situation. Um, and the lover beloved entereth with a song. By common experience, who can deny impossibility for man to show his inward intent, but by signs outwardly as writing, speech or countenance, 
whereby doth grow outward perceiving, inwardly to know, of every secrecy in man's breast wrought. From man unto man the effect of each thought. These things well weighed in many things show need in our outward signs to show us so that plain, according to our thoughts, words, and signs proceed, for in outward signs where men are seen to feign, what credence in man to man may remain? Man's inward mind, with outward signs to fable, may soon be more common than commendable. Much are we lovers then to be commended, for love his appearance dissembleth in no wise. But as the heart feeleth like signs away pretended, who feign in appearance are love's mortal enemies. As in despair of speed, who that can mirth devise, or having grant of grace can show them as mourners, such be no lovers, but even very scorners. The true lover's heart that cannot obtain is so tormented that all the body is evermore so compelled to complain that sooner may the sufferant hide the fury of a fervent fever than of that malady. By any human power, by any power human, he possible may hide the least pain of a thousand, I dare say. And he who in loving hath loath to such luck that love for love of his love be found, shall be of power even as easily to pluck the moon in a moment with a finger to the ground, to ground, as of his joy to enclose the rebound, but that the reflection thereof from his heart to his beholders shall shine in each part. Thus be a lover in joy or in care, although will and wit his estate would hide, yet shall his semblance as a dial declare how the clock goeth, which may be well applied, in abridgment of circumstance for a guide, to lead you in few words by my behaviour to know me in grace of my lady's favour. For being a lover as I am indeed, and there to dispose thus pleasantly, is a plain appearance of my such speed, as I in love could wish, and undoubtedly my love is requited so lovingly, that in everything that may delight in mind, my wit cannot wish it so well as I find. Which thing, at full considered, I suppose, that all the whole world must agree in one voice, I being beloved, as I now disclosed, of one being chief in all the whole choice, must have incomparable cause to rejoice. For the highest pleasure that man may obtain is to be a lover beloved again. Neither lover nor loved entereth. Now, God you even, Master Woodcock. Cometh of rudeness or lewdness that mock? Come whereof it shall, ye come of such stock, that God you good even, Master Woodcock. This lozel ha by like hath lost his wit. Nay, nay, Master Woodcock, not a wit. I have known you for a woodcock, or this, or else like a woodcock, I take you admit amiss. But though for a woodcock he deny the same, yet shall your wit witness you meet for that name. How so? Thus, lo, I do perceive by your former process that ye be a lover, whereto ye confess yourself beloved in loving wise, as by wit and will ye can wish to devise concluding therein determinately that of all pleasures pleasant to the body the highest pleasure that man may obtain is to be a lover beloved again in which conclusion before all this flock i shall prove you plain as wise as a woodcock and methinks this woodcock is turned on thy side contrary to courtesy and reason to use thus rudely to rail or any word be tried 
on proof of thy part, whereby I do refuse to answer the same. Thou canst not excuse thy folly in this, but if thou wilt say aught, assay to say better, for this saying is naught. Well, since it is so that ye be discontent to be called fool, or further matter be spent, will ye give me leave to call ye fool anon, when yourself perceiveth that I have proved you one? Yea, by my soul, and will take it in good worth. So now, by my father's soul, then will we even forth, that part rehearse of your saying or this, of all our debate, the only cause is, for where ye afore have fastly affirmed that such as be lovers again beloved stand in most pleasure that to man may move, that tale to be false truth shall truly prove. What folk above those live more pleasantly? What folk? Marry, even such folk as am I. Being no lover, what man may ye be? No lover? No, by God, I warrant ye. I am no lover in no manner meant, as doth appear in this purpose present. For as touching women, go where I shall, I am at one point with women all. The smotest, the smirkest, the smallest, the truest, the trimmest, the tallest, the wisest, the worthiest, the wildest, the merriest, the manualiest, the mildest, the strangest, the straightest, the strongest, the lustiest, the least, or the longest. The rashest, uh, the ruddiest, the roundest, the sagest, the sallowest, the soundest, the coyest, the cursest, the coldest, the busiest, the brightest, the boldest, the thankfulest, the thinnest, the thickest, the thickest, the saintliest, the sourest, the sickest. Take these, or with all the rest, and of every one. So God be my help, I love never a one. Then I beseech thee. Okay, this we, one we, thing. Oh, we sorry. have to pause after after that stanza. That that I wasn't going to pause till the end of this scene, but whoa. Um, that um, that's. Uh, <laughs> it, it would be a great temptation to say maybe it was written to be sung, but I love the idea of speaking it as fast as possible. Um, Angela, how did you find that? I mean, you could have taken it, uh, you could have, you could have done a lot with that because you could have made faces for each one of the different types, you know, so obviously you could have really spread that out a bit. I, I don't, I hadn't read it carefully <laughs> to think of, to think of doing it then. Now, of course, I can think of it. <laughs> you could, or you could, it's the sort of speech where you can single people out in the audience and, and point at them. Uh, number three, uh, or this, uh, neither love nor loving, does seem to really be conscious that there's an audience. Saying, before all this flock, I will prove you a woodcock. Um, so, uh, and before that, we had that lovely speech by the lover beloved, um, which is, again, some, some lovely verse there. Helen, how did you find that? Well, uh... I could have done with punctuation. Um, I mean, I, I I was struggling with it at times to 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 get the sense of it, but yes, it it's it's a nice um, it's a nice enough speech. Um, I I was somewhat puzzled by the fact that neither lover nor loved enters after the speech, because neither lover nor loved has obviously heard it. So I would tend to put that entry at the beginning of that speech. Yeah, that, that might be, that might be nice that he's, uh, that, uh, yes, that neither lover nor loved is, is, you know, in the background, lurking, listening, hopefully not pulling too much focus with their mockery. Uh, but, uh, yeah, and um, you know, in a in a twenty first century sense, uh, one can one can see the neither lover nor loved character as as asexual representation or a romantic representation, which is um, 
kind of nice and they they claim to have the only balanced perspective on the whole th thing uh, hell yeah what, what do we has anyone any views on the significance of a woodcock well it's a stupid bird isn't it is it yes ah yes they're they're very cute they're ground ground dwelling little brown birds with a long long bill and they were supposed to be quite easy to trap, and so they became a metaphor for foolishness. Right. That I didn't know. I, I don't know. I, they might be endangered now. Rachel, what? I mean, if they're easy to ensnare, and it's kind of calling him like a fool, uh, that metaphor of, of trapping, perhaps it's calling on something like that in the way that, um, uh, and that he's saying the, to the lover who is... Uh, you know the lover beloved uh you know it's kind of like saying to him uh, the ball and chain or like the old ball and chain that you know referring to marriage in that way and viewing it in that um imprisonment imprisonment uh trapping sort of metaphor viewpoint um as opposed to being you know a free bird single ready to fly ready to mingle wherever he wants as Definitely play Freebird. <laughs> Sorry, I, I interrupted. No, no, I was just going to say there's a, there was an early modern um, proverb that said hanging and marriage go by destiny. Uh, Helen. Yes, there's another one proverb too, um, which I think, uh, I don't think it's referred to, but it's it's got the same sense of it. When um, the lover beloved says that love can't be hidden or it it's um two things cannot be hid love and a cough <laughs> yes it it sort of goes hand in hand with the i've never heard a man confess to being either rich or asleep um, but uh, but yes love and a cold cannot be hidden i i was thinking of that too that I wonder if if your character Helen, the lover beloved, was uh, saying was making the case for them being the most honest because they can't hide their joy in their condition. Could be. So, uh, and and perhaps Rachel, with the metaphor of entrapment uh, that you were talking about, perhaps. Uh, perhaps our neither loving nor loved character is setting up an elaborate rhetorical trap to catch uh, to catch their interlocutor. Um, we shall we shall see. Uh, but uh, but Helen, I believe your character has a question uh, for for neither loving nor loved uh, that uh, from in your own time from then I beseech thee. Then I beseech thee. This one thing, tell me. How many women thinks thou dost love thee? Sir, as I be saved, by aught I can prove, I am beloved, even like as I love. Then, as appearest by these words rehearsed, thou art neither lover nor beloved. Neither lover nor beloved, that is even true. Since that is true, I marvel what can ensue for proof of thy part, in that thou madest a vaunt of both our estates to prove thine most ple pleasant. My part for most pleasant may soon be guessed by my continual quieted rest. Being no lover, who may quiet be? Nay, being a lover, what man is he that is quiet? Marry, I. Marry, ye lie. What patience, my friend, ye are too hasty. If you will patiently mark what I shall say, your sh yourself shall perceive me in quiet all way. Say what thou will, and I therein protest to believe no word thou sayest most nor lest. Then we twain shall talk both in vain, I see, except our matter awarded may be, by judgment of some indifferent hearer. Marry, go thou and be an inquirer, and if thou canst bring one anything likely, he shall be admitted for my part quickly. Now, by the good God, I grant to agree, for be thou assured it scorneth me that thou shouldst compare in pleasure to be like me, 
and surely I promise thee, one way or other, I will find redress. Find the best, and next way thy wit can guess, and accept your knobs for malice, do need ye. Make brief return, a fellowship speed ye. Okay, let's let's break briefly before before the mega speech. Um, because, Lord, this yeah, this speech takes us all the way about uh, halfway through the play. Um, we could always share it if you'd like. <laughs> um, I think part of it is that the text we have, there are no stanza breaks, and we we're using. Uh, Haywood, I think, is using, I'm counting lines, a seven-line stanza uh, that, uh, almost a ballad stanza, but not quite, uh, that's um, A, B, A, B, B, C, C. Um, so sometimes when I have a long speech like that, I'll add the stanza breaks just to, to let m myself know where the transitions are. But... Uh, uh, the uh, the lover beloved has has exited to find uh, to find to find what Helen, a, an arbiter, a referee, a judge. Yes, someone impartial, more impartial than uh, than neither loving nor loved. Well, neither of us are in the least impartial. It's true. You both think that you're the best, and and certainly you're both very happy the way you are. Why can't you just both be the winners of this argument? Um, but that's not how Haywood works. Someone has to win. <laughs> it's interesting you've got two miserable people and two happy people, you know, because you they've gone to get an arbiter as well, but their arbiter is going to say which of them is most miserable. It seems rather pointless for two people who are perfectly happy to have an argument, but there it is. <laughs> it's true, it's, it's true. Uh, I wonder. Um, Yes, I can think of a few potential uh, arguments that that arbiter might make, but I guess we'll have to see next session, which is on Thursday. Um, so now that uh, now that the lover beloved has exited, um, neither loving nor loved has the stage to themselves and is going to give us a taste of their philosophy. Um, yes. Uh, in, in your in your own time, Angela. My marvel is no more than my care is small. What knave this fool shall bring, being not partial. And yet he be false and a foolish knave too, so that it be not much ado to bring a door to hear and speak right. I foresee for no man the worth of a mite. And since my doubt is so small in good speed, what should my study be more than my need? Till time I perceive this woodcut coming, my part hereof should pass even in mumming. Saving for past time, since I consider him he being a lover and all his matter to depend on love, and contrary, I no lover, by which all such standing by as favour my part, she will, may fear me too weak against the loving of this lover to speak. I shall, for your comfort, declare such a story as shall perfectly plant in your memory that I have knowledge in lovers' laws, as deep as some dozen of those doting doors, which told all ye whose fancies stick near me shall know it causeless in this case to fear me. For though as I show I am no lover now, nor never have been, yet shall I show you how that I once chanced to take in hand to feign myself a lover, ye shall understand, towards such a sweeting as by sweet scent savour I know not the like in fashion and favour. And to begin at setting in, first was her skin, white, smooth and thin, and every vein so blue seen plain, her golden hair, to see her wear her wearing gear. Alas, I fear to tell all to you, I shall undo you. Her eye so rolling, each heart controlling. Her nose not long, nor stood not wrong. Her fingertips so clean she clips, 
her rosy lips so fair, so ruddy it axeth study, the whole to tell it did excel. It was so made that even the shade at every glade would hearts invade, the pap so small and round withal, that wa the waist not mickle, but it was tickle, the thigh, the knee, as they should be, but such a leg a lover would beg to set eye on. But it is gone. Then sight of the foot, right rift hearts to the root, her cheeks gossips. And last of all, St Catherine's wheel was never so round as was her hair heel. Assault her heart, and who could win it, as for her heel do hold in it? Let over that her beauty was so much in pleasant qualities, her graces were such for dalliant pastance, uh, pass where she should, no greater difference between lead and gold than between the rest and her. And such a wit that no wight, I ween, might match her in it. If she had not wit to set wise men to school, then shall my tale prove me a stark fool. But in this matter to make you meet to guess, ye shall understand that I, with this mistress, fell late acquainted, and for no love, for, and for love no wit, but for my pleasure to approve my wit. How I could love to this tricker dissemble, who in dis dissmiling, dissimiling, was perfect and nimble. For where or when she gave, she list to give a mock, she could, and would, do it beyond the knock. Wherein I thought that if I teased her, I should thereby like my wit the better. And if she chanced to trip or tries me, it should let me it should to learn wit a good lesson be. Thus, for my pastime, I did determine to mock or be mocked of this mocking vermin. For which in her presence I did first obtain, and that obtained forthwith fell we twain in great acquaintance, and made as good cheer as if we had been acquainted twenty year. And I, through fair flattering behaviour, seemed anon so deep in her favour, that though the time then so far passed was, that time required us asunder to pass. Yet could I no passport get of my sweeting, till I was full wooed for the next day's meeting. For surance thereof I must, as she bade, give her engaged best jewel I there had. And after much mirth, as our wits could devise, we parted. And I, the next morn, did arise in time, not too timely, such time as I could. I allow no love where sleep is not allowed. I was, or I entered this journey, vowed, decked very cleanly, but not very proud. But trim must I be, for slovenly lobbers have ye what well no place among lovers. But I thus decked at all points point device. At door where this trull was, I was as nice, whereat I knocked her presence to win, wherewith it was opened, and I was let in. And at my first coming my minion seemeth very merry, but anon she misdeemed that I was not merrily disposed. And so she might, and so might she think, for I disclosed no word nor look but such as showed as sadly, as I indeed inwardly thought madly. And so must I show, for lovers be in rate sometimes merry, but most times passionate, in giving thanks to her of overnight, we set us down an heavy couple in sight. And therewithal I set a sigh, <sighs> such one as made the form shake which we both sat on. Whereupon she, without more words spoken, fell in weeping, as her heart should have broken. And I, in secret, laughing so heartily, that from mine eyes came water plenteously. Anon I turned, with look sadly, that she, my weeping as watery as hers, might see. Which done, these words anon to me, she spake. Alas! Dear heart, what wight might undertake to show one so sad as you this morning, being so merry as you last evening? I so far then the merrier for you, 
and without desert, thus far the sadder now. The self-thing, quoth I, which made me then glad, the self-same is thing that maketh me now sad. The love that I owe you is original, ground of my late joy and present pain all. And by this mean, love is evermore laid between two angels, one good and one bad, hope and dread, which two be always at strife. Which one of them, both with love, shall rule most rife? And hope, that good angel, first part of last night, drew dread, that bad angel, out of place quite. Hope swear I should straight have your love at once, and dread that bad angel swear blood and bones, that if I won your love all in one hour, I should lose it all again in three or four, wherein this good angel hath lost the mastery, and I by this bad angel won this agony. And be sure I stand now in such case, that if I lack your continued grace, in heaven, hell or earth, there is not that he, save only God, that knoweth what shall come on me. I love not in rate all the common common flock. I am no feigner, nor I cannot mock. Wherefore I beseech you that your reward may witness that ye do my truth regard. Sir, as touching mocking, quoth she, I am sure ye be too wise to put that here in awe, for neither give I cause why ye should so do, nor naught could ye win that way worth an old shoe. For whoso that mocketh shall surely stir this old proverb, mockum mockabitur, the mocker shall be mocked. But as for you, I think think myself assured that very love hath you hither allured for which quoth she let hope hop up again and vanquish dread so that it be in vain to dread or to doubt but i in everything as cause giveth cause will be your own darling <gasps> sweetheart a cause I, after stormy cold smarts, warm words in warm lovers bring lovers warm hearts. And so have your words warmed my heart even now, that dreadless and doubtless now must I love you. Anon there was I love you and I love you, lovely we lovers love each other, I love you and I for love love you, my lovely being loved loved brother, love me love thee love we love he love she. Deeper love, apparently, in no twain can be, quite over the years in love, and felt no ground had not swimming holp in love I had been drowned. But I swore by the shore the vantage to keep, to mock her in love seeming to swim more deep. Thus continued we day by day, till time that a month was passed away. In all the which time such a weight she took that by no mean I might once set one look upon any woman in company. But straightway she set the finger in the eye, and by that same aptness in jealousy I thought sure she loved me perfectly. And I, to show myself in like loving, dissimiled like cheer in all her like looking. By this and other like things then in hand, I gave her mocks, methought, above a thousand, whereby I thought her own tail, like a burr, stuck to her own back, mocka mogga bitor. And upon this I fell in devising, to bring to an end this idle disguising, whereupon suddenly I stole away, and when I had been absent half a day, my heart misgave me by God that bought me, that if she missed me where I thought she sought me, she sure would be mad by love that she ought me, wherein not love but pity so wrought me, that to return anon I bethought me. And so returned ill chance had brought me to her chamber door, and hard I knocked. Knock soft, quoth one, who the same unlocked, an ancient wise woman, who was never from this said sweeting, but about her ever. Mother, uh, quoth I, 
How doth my uh, dear darling? Dead, wretch, cried she, even by thine absenting. And without more words, the door to her, she shut. I standing without, half out of my wit, in that this woman should die in my fault. But since I could in there by none assault to her chamber window, I gat about, to see in at the last way the course laid out. And there, looking in, by God's blessed, I saw her naked abed with another. And with her bedfellow laughed me to scorn, mother, as merrily as ever she laughed before. The witch, when I saw and then remembered the terrible words that mother brended, and also bethought me of everything showed in this woman true love betokening, myself to see served thus prately, to myself I laughed even heartily, with myself considering to have had like speed if myself had been a lover indeed. But now to make some matter whereby I may take my leave of my love honestly. Sweetheart, quoth I, ye take too much upon ye. But thou hast taken too much upon thee in taking that thou took in hand to mock me. Oh, no more, sorry, no more than becomes me, knowest thou well, quoth she. But thou hast taken too much upon thee in taking that thou took in hand to mock me, wherein from beginning I have seen thee jet like as a fool might have jetted in a net, believing himself save of himself only to be perceived of no living body. But well saw I thine intent and beginning was to bestow a mock on me at ending. When thou laughedst, dissimiling a weeping heart, then I, with weeping eyes, played even the like part, wherewith I brought in mockum mogabitur. And yet thou, being a long-snouted cur, could no whit smell that all my meaning was to give mock for mock, as now is come to pass. Which now, thus passed, if thy wit be handsome, may defend thee from mocks in time to come by clapping faster thou sny snout every day. Mockum mogabator for a nosegay. Wherewith she start up and shut her window too. Which done, I had no more to say or do, but think myself or any man else a fool in mocks or wiles to set women to school. But now to purpose wherefore I began. Although I were made a fool by this woman concerning mocking, yet doth this tale approve that I am well seen in the art of love. For I, intending no love but to mock, yet could no lover of all the whole flock circumstance of love disclose more nor better than did I, the substance being no greater. And by this tale afore ye all may see Although a lover as well loved be, as love can devise him for pleasant speed, yet two displeasures, jealousy and dread, is mixed with love, whereby love is a drink meat to give babes for worms, as it drinketh bitter sweet. And as for this babe, our lover, in whose head by a frantic worm his opinion is bred after one draught of this medicine ministered into his brain by my brain appointed reason shall so temper his opinion that he shall see it not worth an onion and if he have any other thing to lay i have to convince him every way and since my part now doth thus well appear but be ye my partners now all of good cheer. Oh, but silence every man upon a pane. For Master Woodcock, it co Woodcock is now come again. And, oh my gosh, Angela. <laughs> ah, my Rava and Kudas, that, that was a feat. That was a, a feat of endurance and, and drama. What? I think what we should have that should have been a dialogue because you could have had somebody else doing the other part doing the woman 
That would have broken it up quite nicely. It it would have, but how did it feel? Because you, I, I loved how you did it. You made it flow by. It's a nice story, but it's just too much of one voice, you know. So it would have been nice to like set it up. You can imagine it being like, uh, so he starts the story, but then you actually get the, it played out. That would have been quite nice, actually. Rachel. Uh, maybe, um, oh, am I lagging? A little bit. Well, maybe I'm lagging a little. I was just gonna say, um, maybe there was a dumb show going on in the background as he's speaking, because I feel that could be done, that could have been done in a dumb show or done well in a dumb show or the dialogue that Angela suggested for the ways of breaking that up. Yeah. Um, I, Helen, did you raise a hand or was I imagining? No, no, I didn't. Uh, I, 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 except to applaud. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, considering the, the, the awfulness of sight reading a thing like that, um, I I thought the story came through very clearly. It 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 really was, uh, and you, we are quite right that this this particular one, neither loving nor beloved, um, is the one that talks to the audience, because this is all talking to the audience, isn't it? Yeah, the story does remind me of of clowning. It's possible that this character is the clown of the piece. Um, I I like the idea of of Rachel uh, of uh, I or whomever said it of there being maybe a dumb show behind behind the actor or or possibly puppets. The actor could definitely use a puppet as as the lady. <laughs> or something. Yes, but in fact, I think it would be possible to bring. To, to have the the younger the actor the, the the younger character and and the lady um actually performing bits of it yeah because there's a nice you've got an old lady's part haven't you mm. so you've got the old lady to slam the door you've got the person in bed because he says you've taken too much upon you so you, i assume that there's somebody on top of her <laughs> Yeah. You know, so there's a lot of there's a lot of visuals in that, isn't there? Mm. Yeah, it it suddenly becomes. I mean, it's a long speech, and I think we were all braced for impact. But but it becomes um, quite compelling. I, I think probably more so than everyone else's flowers of rhetoric, because um, it's not it's not the character saying. This is why I am the most philosophically sound. It's it's a character being like, let me tell you a thing that happened once. Rachel. This uh, this person is the only one who's given us a real description about the person that they were in a relationship with. Or uh, the other people, it's uh, it's all about them uh, and their their feelings and the, their position in this relationship. And he's given us this, um, or he or they, um, she, you know, has given us this uh, amazing portrait of, of somebody and a, a portrait of another character uh, and several characters and also of a relationship. You're, you're right. Uh even the the lover who was not loved, you would expect a a description of uh, of the physical characteristics of of the lady that fired fired their heart. But in instead, they gave us uh, they just gave us well. This is how my lady makes me feel. Okay, and um, so I I wonder whether the it it actually has me wondering how this will resolve. Will the lover not loved? Um, earn earn the love of I mean will they or or will they be melancholy forever and not learn anything yeah that's right because you've got these arbiters coming haven't you and the thing that's interesting about um the neither love nor loving <laughs> character is that he is absolutely assuming that most people in the audience are on his side so that that he is actually making a direct things whereas the others are just as as Rachel says you know they're 
just about themselves. They're arguing with each other. It's like they're not taking any notice. But he's saying, oh, don't worry. Don't worry, everybody. Who's, who, don't you worry. Uh, you, you think I'm never going to be able to win against this guy that's, you know, loved and uh, and loving. Oh, no, don't you worry. I've got plenty. You know, I'll be I'll be fine. So it's kind of, so it's, it is quite interesting. But he's also brought up, or that speech has brought up, the trouble with love is it comes with jealousy. It comes with dread, you know. And so he's actually identifying these things that make it inevitable that it will break up and be miserable um which which does a little bit touch on the misery of the first two so at some point i'm i suspect all these miseries are going to come together (laughs) (laughs) and how miserable will everyone be when that happens rachel yeah that to what Angela just said that um, these other characters live in a bubble and he comes in and he's like bursting the bubble, you know, especially that they're just talking to each other. But when he comes out and he starts addressing the audience, it is that like little uh, fourth wall break, bubble burst. And also um, how this is like written, um, how we were saying that like rhetorical talk before in this dialogue format that this is, um, uh, I don't know, you know, when uh, two people get lost in a relationship and they're the only two people that exist in the world. And perhaps that's why there's this constraint to only, uh, you know, to making this like a two-hander type thing that could be taken in that way. Yeah. lostness i was i was thinking while you were saying that about the swimming metaphor because we've heard a lot of people say uh, compare being in love to being over shoes in love or over ears in love and uh, and uh this character takes the metaphor a little further to say well i could have drowned except i could swim <laughs> I, I don't know if that's a sex metaphor or what 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 is the gender of these characters that we've met so far so my character is of is a man but i think that greg's character is a man too isn't it yes yeah. so, and, and, and what about the first two isn't one of those yeah one of them's a woman isn't it yeah the woman beloved not loving so that's a woman so we've got three men and a woman a woman so far yeah I wondered, in fact, while we were doing this, how casting different gendered actors might affect the story. It's also strange to have, I mean, strange to my 20th century, 21st century eyes, Generation X, y'all, to, uh, to see to see the gender of one character specified, but the gender of the other three assumed. So does lover does lover automatically mean man is the woman automatically the beloved rachel i thought it i i thought it was that i thought it was that way by that he's um saying that she's a woman uh you know he's not and by not naming the other genders that it's saying that she's either the different one or it's like that um i don't know that thing like where women are made to be wooed or not, and not to woo or something like that uh you know like the difference between a lover and a beloved that one is uh an active thing and then another is something that's being acted upon um so i i don't know if i don't know if that answers the gen- the genders of these characters um but maybe it could be some sort of dialogue about gender roles past and present. Mm, yeah. I'm, I'm a bit puzzled also about how this unmarried woman in the long tail, how come she's in bed with somebody? You know, I mean, like, that's not supposed to happen, you know. <laughs> You're not supposed to do it's, that. It's not supposed to, but people are people throughout history. Of... But there's no, there's no, there's no impression of that being. That's not being, um, uh, you know, uh, deplored at all. 
you know, in fact, she comes over as a kind of quite feisty character. She comes over as a like a courtesan, really. Well, if you read uh, Boccaccio, say the Decameron, a, a happy ending for a Decameron story is they lived happily ever after and she cuckled in him many times over. Um, uh, and the tragic ending is uh, they both died. She probably put his head in a potted plant or something. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so, no, it's a pot of basil. Yes, yes. Delicious severed head pesto. It's it's... <laughs> Yes, Isabella, isn't it? Isabella and the Pot of Basil. Um, his name wasn't Basil, it was something else. <laughs> um, but uh, so I was thinking back to, to those stories where, um, where sexual freedom for both men and women is, is sort of taken for granted. But you're right, that wasn't a social norm of, of uh, 15, uh, 1500s England. Uh, Although, I don't know, perhaps, uh, perhaps standards of quote unquote sexual purity applied more to upper and upper middle class women uh, rather, than to, uh, rather than to women of lower social status. I think it was the other way around, personally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I mean, I think the important thing was not getting pregnant to a man to whom you weren't married. Otherwise, you know, there was a lot of it about. Then, then as now, Rachel? Yeah, um, Helen brought this up once, uh, I think, uh, it was during one of the Edward plays, the one with the Countess, where the king was trying to make her the mistress. And I think you said that in, uh, you know, real life, if somebody was like the mistress of a king, it was a great position to have, you know, because of the perks it could get. Um, and I'm not sure who the man is that she won she's sleeping with, but if he has some sort of position or money, uh, maybe it's something that they're, you know, they're looking the other way at you know, because he could provide something that potentially this guy couldn't. But there's no hint of that um, in the text. It's just her choice. He, he goes away for half a day and she's in bed with someone else. He does, but then up front, uh, Angela's character introduces the woman as a, as a trickster. Um, as as someone as someone given to to uh, to uh, perhaps deception, uh, I don't know whether. Of course, we we only have uh, we only have Angela's word for that. I I don't know whether the character is trying to make himself feel better uh, by by denigrating the woman's uh, ethical standards. Who knows? Well, yeah, that's true, and and you wonder if. She says, I knew all along what you were doing. So it may be that she was in a relationship. She knew what he was trying to do. And so she just let him, played him along. Yes, perhaps the, the fellow she was in bed with was her, her long-term partner who was quite open-minded. Uh, who knows? <laughs> I got the impression that they're both laughing at her. That they, that, sorry, that the couple are both laughing at him. I, I got that impression from those words, but maybe I'm reading that wrong. Yeah, I got that impression too. Um, I think actually that that almost worried the 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 um, uh, the neither loving nor beloved guy um, even more than the fact that the the woman but he 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 was under no he knew he was playing with her affections he had suspicions I, I mean I can't think this came as a shock to him the way he was talking about her well no but he starts off doesn't he by saying it'll be a laugh either 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 it'll be a laugh and I'll trick her or she'll trick me in which case I'll have learned something 
That's what he says. Yeah. And that's actually what he says at the end. He says at the end, he just had a good laugh. You know, because she got him. You got me. You know, that's it. Ah, uh, uh, but I've no doubt it was covering a world of help hurt. <laughs> I, I wonder, I, I wonder whether, whether the, whether the, um, Angela's character might have been more emotionally involved than he lets us that than than he lets us see, and whether this is the incident that maybe put him off love. Well, that that's a suspicion that that leaps at you, isn't it? But um, he says not. He says he says not. Uh, Rachel, I, he's an unreliable narrator. Oh, I think the most, yeah. Rachel? Yeah. Um, I wonder if it is just one of those breakup speeches of, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know, actually. The, but what Helen just said about the unreliable narrator, I think all these people to an extent are a little unreliable just because there's so much uh, detail left out. But the length of this speech, uh, now thinking about it, it, a production would choose if they believed everything he was saying about this woman, um, or if this was just uh, you know a scorned man in a breakup. Yeah, I think you could you could play it either you could play it either way, and it would be fun to experiment with, Helen. Yeah, I mean, I'd been talking Lewis Carroll about earlier speeches, which seemed very Lewis Carroll-ish, but now I'm getting a hint of Les Liaisons Dangereuses. That's right. That's I thought that, I couldn't remember the name of it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It, it is a bit Valmont, isn't it? You know, I shall do this thing for my amusement and... Uh, and then you end up falling in love anyway, and then you end up dying in a duel, and um, and this whole thing was written by a priest to show how sinful everyone is. Um, oh well, that 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 works it, but uh, I I must say I haven't read it. I've only seen the film. It film film was nice, but uh, yeah, I mean the 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 Lewis Carroll comparison. Um, intrigues me because Carol, as we know, was a mathematician. So all of his, um, a, a lot of his most memorable stuff are games with logic. And he'll, he'll, he'll establish a whole thing on perfectly logical principles that when applied to reality, make no sense. And, and this is partly, I guess, what trying to, trying to apply a, 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 a systematic uh, process like rhetoric onto such a chaotic thing as love um, might might be. Mm. So I, I think we're probably about done here. I'll go around the room quickly for final thoughts and the fickle finger of fate lands on Greg, first of all. I'm really curious to see where this goes tomorrow on Thursday. I, I, yeah, it would be interesting. I, <laughs> I think I was just so tired after tongue twisting myself around all those wonderful lines. But it was I, I, once I found the rhythm, and we've we've said this so many times. Once you find the rhythm with these things, it's a lot lot easier to read them. Yeah, you get in the zone. I was very impressed. Mm. And. Uh, Rachel, final thoughts? I, uh, ha I, I'm kind of confused for some of these. Uh, I know it's a comedy, so the emotional stakes are different for the people in this. Um, but I, I, I'm kind of thrown as to how you would, how you would perform this. I'll have to go back and listen to the podcast and see what uh, they did with this um, to get more insight into that. Yeah, as as we have said, a full cast audio adaptation is available at the Beyond Shakespeare Audio Boom uh, channel and anywhere else that good podcasts are available. Um, Angela, final thoughts? 
Well, despite having to read for what felt like about two hours. Um... <laughs> it was great, though. Um, I did think that it kind of like started to get going, and now I'm really hoping that what happens is all these all these um, mediators come and everybody falls in love with each other. So that's what I want to happen at the end. So, but I am getting quite interested in what will happen. I mean, I must admit, it kind of like warmed up a bit. It's true. How could this possibly be resolved? Uh, I guess serve people a few drinks and see what happens. Um, Helen, final thoughts. Yes, um, following Greg's reading, which which was um, really interesting, where he's managed to speed it up, I made an attempt to do the same thing, but failed totally because none of my thoughts were end. None of the lines were end stop thoughts. Um, the the thought continued and ended halfway through the next line, almost. Inevit in invariably, it seemed to me, but um, I may be exaggerating that slightly. But I, I think there is a lot of variety in the w verse. I mean, we had what I don't think were skeletonics, but they seemed like it in the middle of Angela's uh, long, long, long speech. And then you'll it goes into a whole variety of rhythms and... and uh, um, rhyme schemes and then uh, there may be a reason for it all or maybe just for variety to show what the author can do you're right the various characters do seem to have different tones uh, much as much as haywood is interested in arguments uh, they if one has to look for it but they are written it seems as actual people um the and and yeah helen from your character's speech i got much more of a sort of like a broad flowing river rather mm -hmm. than your your you know rapid torrent of 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 uh the the first scene um yeah i'll i i too will be interested to to see how this shakes out how can this possibly resolve uh, will anyone ever find love? Uh, and, and will the one character who has it keep it? Uh, tune in uh, in a couple days to find out uh, on the Beyond Shakespeare YouTube channel, a very pleasant place where you can find many more works and indeed many more verse spoken by us and, and, and many other wonderful readers. Uh, and that's all All that remains is to thank our wonderful team of readers, uh, to wave to you, the viewer. I hope you're happy, whether you're in love or not, um, and to say goodbye. <laughs>